All right. So, oh yeah, we got some fun hops on here. We got a microphone that is in my forehead instead of my mouth. They're adjustable. <laughs> There we go. That should sound a little better now, or look a little better at least. What is going on? My computer won't start. Um, we got, oh, some ESB strain going on. And um, let's see what else. We got, we got one major topic. And then one secondary topic. <laughs> I would have done most of this this morning, but I had something else to go run and do early in the morning. So you know what? That's just life. You ran without me, didn't you? I did not run, actually, yet, but I do plan on running later. I think I still have my clothes here. Sweet. Yeah, well, let's do it. Going for a run. Sounds right. like a good idea. Perfect. We got 18 people watching. Now we have 19 people watching. Nice. Oops. Let's, uh, let's not give them Inception audio, either. <laughs> that'd be, that could be very confusing. Yeah. Audio on audio on audio. Yeah. Audio playing into the mic. Mm. Hey, some other people are going to be brewing milkshake IPAs. We've done a whole video on uh, a milkshake IPA before, so we're not going to we're not going to rehash out milkshake IPA as a style breakdown. However, we will be building a specific recipe that we're going to give to Homebrew for Life uh, because he commented back on one of our uh, comments saying he's totally down to try the style. But uh, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. He also thinks it's dumb, which <laughs> I kind of half agree with him, but that's not what. Uh, People that consume beer think. That's true. Logan's not a fan of the style. <sighs> I just I just miss clear lagers. Like they're good. Okay. Anyway, beer what news. Do you, what do you mean you miss clear lagers? <laughs> <laughs> uh, beer news. Let's start with that. Genus news. What do we do? Yeah, yeah. We made two beers yesterday. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. We, uh, I I had like a whole three percent involvement in that. Uh, I was more. You were like sixteen percent involved. <laughs> You were uh, 9.6. I ran six, back nine. there. I took care of some teabagging and then disappeared again. That was pretty much my, my involvement. But now we have a soon-to-be chai, green, onion, uh, what else was in there? Ginger, uh, ginger Saison going on. Yes. So. Oh, God, you pitched a Saison used to. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. It, was a, it, was the, it was the vote slash rock, paper, scissors yeah. off that turned that into a Saison. So. <laughs> Don't worry. Yours truly showed up early this morning and saved them, too, because uh, I came in to find we forgot to put bags over at them. least one of the clear fermenters being blasted with the morning sun <laughs> through the window. And I'm like, yeah. Our brew house is really not uh, efficiently designed for not having sunlight in them. <laughs> Probably need to get. It's a, yeah, yeah, good thing some, most of our fermenters are stainless. Yeah. We, we, uh, a, a quick trick that we use, actually, to uh, <laughs> mitigate that is we, actually, we just use uh, black garbage bags bags and we throw them over the fermenters and uh, that seems to do the trick just fine it works just good for us um and other news so the whole thing that spurred the idea for this uh this live streams topic is uh homebrew for life did a video um uh where basically they said that they uh, are not a fan of sour milkshake ibas we already told, already told you that part but uh yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about that down the road so that's why this video is happening we're going to talk about how to get other people that are brew tubing to do things together. <laughs> Nailed it. Yep. <laughs> way to way to make that clear. You know, we're on fire. We'll just that's a whole topic. So I figured uh, I was going to start talking about it and then I was like, "No, nah, we'll just talk about it when we talk about the topic." Other news. Our governor reopened or gave us a schedule for reopening, which basically says that we will be starting to almost reopen in another month. Yeah, at what if they decide to, if they don't change it again. Yeah, if they don't change that's, it again, yeah. <laughs> that's Oh man, that's frustrating. But uh, hopefully here, May 31st ends or whatever it is, and uh, we can start having people in the tap room consuming beer in the tap room again as a part of the phase two for whatever jankiness they uh, pull out of their butts this time. Yeah, we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, so at least there's some outline, some almost light at the end of the tunnel, something like that. But uh yeah, so we will not be uh, open for at least a month in hey, terms of taproom sales. All I know is I'm going fishing on Tuesday. Important things, everyone. Important things, right? Hey, yeah, we got that. Yeah, so they're opening up fishing at least. So Peter gets some smoked trout again. I do like smoked trout. <sighs> he likes anything smoked in and around his face. Yeah, pole. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, mostly meats. <laughs> Otherwise, um, craft beer week is a thing that's still happening this spring. I don't know. Is it dead? 
Is it, what, what do you guys think out there? Yeah, what, is, are you, what are you seeing in your area for Craft Beer Week? Is there still events being planned, things going on? Uh, are there more online things that are going to be going on? We keep looking over because there's somebody pacing back and forth in our parking lot. It's really, <laughs> it's really weird. I'm like, what is this guy doing? Um, yeah, um, but yeah, so Craft Beer Week, typically we got all these like events, usually tons of collaborations going on um, and beer releases that just get a lot of people out, get a lot of people crowded in spaces, which we obviously can't do during these times. And yep. uh, so, I mean, we still have plans for doing a beer release every single day of Craft Beer uh, Week, which is, you know, that's the beauty of, I guess, our situation is that we brew all these like fun little experimental five gallon batches. So, so we, we can have a lot of them. Yeah, so we have a lot of awesome. We have a lot of fresh beer. That's that's the beauty of us. Actually, we have a lot of fresh beer that um, is like going to be raring to go on tap come uh, Craft Beer Week for us this month. And a number of those are beers that we actually did for uh, YouTube experiments too. So the things yep. that you'll get to sh- uh, sharing with, even if you're not uh, here presently. Yeah. Unfortunately, though, for the breweries that you know don't have the n- little nano capacity like we do. Um, it might be a little interesting. It might be a little tough to, to really kind of get that uh, get that momentum built up and get the excitement there because, um, yeah, I mean, last couple of years, it's been amazing in Spokane. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully we can still get people to, uh, to be excited about Craft Beer Week. Um, and hopefully there's other breweries that are still doing some fun things in terms of uh, trying to come out with some new beers. I know it's really hard for breweries that are especially on the bigger scale to be pushing out new beers just because they've already probably have so much inventory that they yeah. need to get through. So they're like, yeah, oh, be tuned in last Last week, you know that. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. It sounds like a lot of people are just kind of canceling events, and uh, yeah. Hopefully, Craft Beer Week will continue. I mean, we need to get. We honestly, I, I think as a uh, as a general beer drinking community, uh, support support your craft breweries. I mean, I'm sure everyone that's watching already yeah. does that, but uh, but yeah, they're uh, you know we're we're hurting right now as a as an industry and and we need to we need to keep keep going don't let the big guys get a hold of us uh, absolutely uh there, there there is a good chance that a number of breweries won't make it especially if they uh, there are breweries that are struggling to get uh um get the federal funding and everything <laughs> like that so somebody already commented on the glove um, why the glove nice oh yeah he's uh, michael jackson i'm michael jackson what's the uh, someone come up with a good pun that's like the michael jackson of janitorial services <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's that's basically I'm what like, Logan goes for with that. I'm like, I clean it. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. No, actually, the glove really is for we have a bucket of pretty heavy duty bleach water and my hands were cracking from dunking them in there so many times. So I don't always wear two gloves, but, you know, whatever glove I'm grabbing. But when the ble- I do, I prefer Dos Equis. <laughs> <laughs> whatever glove I'm uh, grabbing the bleach rag with to wipe things down. Hayden says their local homebrew shop is going to be doing the koala challenge with the Sasquatch Man for Craft Beer Week. Um, that sounds really fun. I'm hope, yeah, I really hope that your uh, your local homebrew shop does do that. That's wait, I what is the koala challenge? I've not heard of this. You haven't heard of the koala challenge? No. Don't worry. Uh, that, at least four more people have heard of it as of last night. Okay, koala challenge. I feel it because it, when I think of koala, I think of when I put my son on my shoulders and he kind of falls asleep and just sort of hangs on to my head. Yeah, it's kind of like that, but with adults. <laughs> Sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, let us know if you want to hear more about the whatever Peter just said, Koala Challenge. Koala Challenge. <laughs> All right. On to our ready. Beer of the week. Beer of the week. Beer of the week. Boom, boom. And what is our beer of the week? You just pulled this out of your butt. so No, it's definitely uh, very well thought out. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to do beer of the week to be the, uh, the sour milk chick IPA because, like I said, we've already done that. I wanted it to be something that has one similar ingredient, and that is the pastry stout. What, do we throw pastries at a beer? Yes, but we actually okay. just we go to Krispy Kreme, buy some donuts, and we just chuck them at the beer. Not even in the beer. Just you gotta throw go, them near the beer. Okay, Krispy Kreme, that's, like a, that's a cop-out right there. <laughs> Crisp, everybody knows Krispy Kreme donuts are actually just illusions of your imagination. Yeah, you can eat like 50 of them and then start to think that you ate one. <laughs> Let's actually go to like a, a, a local-ish donut shop and, and see if we can do something better. Yeah, but if I say a local donut shop, not everyone's going to get it. What are the best local donut shops? Annie's? I don't know. But anyone in Spokane, uh, jot down some donut shops for us. We don't really eat donuts, so. Well, that's true, we don't. Honestly, we, other than beer, both of us are generally relatively healthy. Bam. And, until uh, Logan gets a hold of ice cream sandwiches. Hey, 
Ice cream sandwiches are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyways, back onto the pastry stout. By the way, we were talking about the beer of the week. Uh, pastry stout is a, basically a stout that's uh, intensified in terms of uh, supplementary flavors, basically. So when you think pastry stout, you got to think a lot of, uh, first of all, lactose. lactose I was going to say, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, you got to have that extra creaminess, that extra sweetness. That you, That's the similar ingredient to the... Uh, milkshake sour IPA that we're gonna be talking about a little bit later um, but also there are other flavors than a pastry style are intensified you got to be using like you know lots of chocolate additive or uh, you know vanilla or whatever other flavors you want to throw at it but building that recipe up as sweet as possible pretty much as you know sugars ferment and very masterfully if you can to hopefully develop some idea of a pastry in your final beer so like what uh, if you threw some raspberries at it I, I, I am not opposed to that idea now we kind of want to do it Pastry stout happening soon. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, throw some raspberries. At ra raspberries will give you some tartness on top of that sweetness. Um, that's the flavor of raspberries, from my experience, is just very strong. You don't have to throw a whole lot, like a few pounds of puree in there in, in a five-gallon batch. And, and with the acidity of the raspberries, I mean, that's that, I think the pastry stout is actually a better thing to add to raspberries unless you're going completely the opposite direction, going sour. A yeah. lot of those mid-range beers, throwing raspberries at it kind of doesn't work because they're also sour or also tart. Yeah. But if you've got a big, sweet body on that, a little bit of that raspberry can definitely work. Yep. Um, raspberry, black cherry maybe too. Yeah. Um, cherry season should be coming up, and I have a feeling there'll be, at least here in Washington, there's going to be a ton of of cherries that uh, need to be picked because fun facts they're not allowing any of the workers to come up and pick them so and this, yeah. that's literally going to be like end of this month going into june something like that so lots of cherries come up to washington help us pick them uh -huh. and then bring them to us and we'll throw them in beer um uh, donut Parade. So here are all the Spokane donut <laughs> shops we've si seen so far. We've got Amy's Donuts, Hello Sugar, and Donut Parade. And then uh, somebody in Texas said Shipley's. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> Well, Shipley's ship. I was going to say, I was like, there's got to be a, yeah. Uh, <laughs> send, a, uh, send us donuts. <laughs> it's going to be so bad by the time they get here. It's like three-week delivery stink, time. Apparently because there's a fly that literally just landed on the microphone. Well, you always think so. That's kind of a, a given. <laughs> Anyways, let's talk about the malt of the week. <laughs> malt of the week. What is the malt of the week? Peter, this is this is you. High what? color pale. <laughs> High color. Oh, like the Northwest pale from Great yeah. Western? Oh, that's a good malt. Exactly. I like that malt. It's that's a great malt for pastry salad. It's almost like I thought this out. For all two minutes of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, the Northwest uh, high color pale from uh, Great Western malting over in kind of the other corner of the state, Vancouver, Washington. Um, that is, uh, I like to describe it as similar to Munich malt, but uh, it's got a little bit more, it's not as biscuity as Munich malt. Is that, is that a yeah. good way to say it? So it's um, a, obviously it's higher color. So the, uh, the base malt, it's a base malt that's a little bit darker than Tiro. And uh, the, yeah, the sweetness in it isn't biscuity. It's, it's just very focusedly su sweet, but not caramel sweet. Um, other than that, kind of a difficult. Uh, yeah, it's it like a, a toffee sweet. Yeah, it's that's that's a better way to say it. More difficult flavor to describe, but it is overall relatively neutral. It is a base malt, and it is similar to Tiro, but it just has that intense yeah color underlying it. Color you know, compared I guess, to Tiro. I guess the color isn't quite as dark as um, Munich malts, or at least light Munichs, which are typically like seven to ten lova bar, and this one is three, three and some change. Yeah, a little over three. So still like twice the color, or close to it, that you're looking at for. Uh, for like a super super pale malt it's like a maris otter but without the graininess that you can get from maris otter yeah yeah no not the graham cracker more on the toffee side right perfect so, nailed that one yeah anyways yeah uh, that's from great western that is their high color pale and it is a great malt to use as the base for a pastry stout let's go on to the hop of the week Sabro? I pick Sabro. Yeah, Sabro. Sabro. I pick Sabro. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, again, this is another style that we do a lot of styles that don't really intensely focus on hops. And so uh, the hop uh, in this one, I figured if it's used elo elegantly, could be just a little eloquently. nice. Eloquently. <laughs> eloquently. Yeah. It's used with good wordingnesses. <laughs> um, but it could, could just give this nice uh, undertone, basically, of a little bit of a coconut flavor, which is kind of the dominant um, the flavor picky outy thing that you get from Sabro. And we just got some super freshies in, so that's probably why he's saying that. That's true, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I was going to yeah. pick Brew One, but then I was like, I really have no idea yeah. how Brew One would fit into a pastry I'm stout. actually really curious about the Sabro because I think the last batch we had in was an 18 crop, mm -hmm. um, if I'm correct. And we, we got the 19 crop in, and it's supposed to be um, have a lot of like strong coconut type aromatics to it. And I really didn't get that when we were using it. Yeah. Um, at least not, not as like much as the hype 
was about it, so I'm curious if this 19 crop has more of that character that it's supposed to have. Yeah, it'll be really fun to, uh, to play around with and experiment. Maybe when we do our sour milkshake IPA, we can do something with coconut. Speaking of which, yeast of the week. Yeast of the week. This is Fuller Strain, my personal number one favorite yeast of all time. Fuller Strain is going to be the pub in uh, Imperial Yeast. It's going to be London ESB 1968 in Y Yeast. And in White Labs, it's going to be White Labs. I don't know. We haven't carried White Labs for like three years, so I was wondering if you remember. It's 002. uh, I think it's just called English Ale. And WLP002 in in White Labs. Um, But yeah, Fuller's is one of the oldest uh, London breweries that's out there. Uh, They do phenomenal ESBs and uh, English style beers, basically. Uh, London ESB, the Fuller strain, is uh, highly flocculent, which means it can be finicky if you are using it in like a high gravity beer. it likes to fall asleep basically at around 10 20 to 10 30 if you don't actively coax it but the flavor it produces is phenomenal and it does produce nice bright beers nice bright beers don't let it get too cold i think that's another thing for it yeah um get down in those like lower 60s it also wants to fall asleep on you but i think i feel i think i figured out why why you chose this strain and that's because every beer i've had brewed with this strain has a very very soft round finish to it, and oh, yeah. I think that's that's what you're going for in a pastry stout. You're you're not wanting it to be sharp. You know, you don't want to be throwing something like the like the good old Chico strain at it because uh, you're trying to round that out. Um, and if you ferment it at a little higher temperature, say uh, you know pushing those upper 60s close to 70, you might start getting some fruity notes, which could actually um, be almost identical to whatever fruit you might be throwing at it, be it be it something like uh, peaches or something like that. Yeah, it's a very delicate, and uh, they, like you said with Chico, that would definitely that would sharpen the beer, and you don't want to do that sharpening. Yeah. So You nailed it. If you're in Britain, you can mm. culture it up from bottles of Bengal Lancer or 1845. Nice. There you go. If you want to spend all that time. <laughs> or for $10, you can just buy an awesome pack of yeast. We also live within like a stone's throw of these yeast companies, and so it's... That's a really far stone's throw. I've got a really strong arm. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can drive there in about five hours. So. Yeah. <laughs> My stone will beat him. Uh, they do <laughs> actually ship. Uh, it's less than 24 hours from my experience. Oh, from yeah. When they, they ship it out one afternoon and it usually gets here about noon the next day so absolutely pretty yeah, so, impressive shipping which means that we get it hella fresh because it's also usually made that m- that monday so usually what happens is we order um before monday and then they ship it out wednesday and it gets here thursday <laughs> somebody's asking about focus are we out of focus i don't know i think he just means us focusing oh like uh i don't know we've we've, we've gone on tangents a couple times before getting to the we're not tangential at all yeah Beer All right. Well, that week. sums up our beer of the week. Let's go on to our main topic, which is probably what everybody hopped on here to actually listen to. Yeah. So uh, the whole story, and this is a video you guys should go check out. Homebrew for Life is awesome if you haven't already followed them or seen them on YouTube. So definitely go check them out. Um, but uh, they did a recipe building vi- video where they were basically going over Bruce Smith, Beer Smith, um, how that software functions, and uh, copying a recipe from uh, one of their homebrewing magazines onto Beer Smith uh, and eventually they're going to brew it um but during that ch the progenitor the lead the lead guy in home brew for life um he said that uh sour milkshake ipas sound gross i mean they kind of (laughs) do until you there's a lot of things that sound gross until you put them in your mouth yeah that's all i can say about that so when done when done right so we've actually uh the funny thing about that and the thing that i commented it is it's one of our top sellers when we have them on because we've done a decent amount of sour milkshake ipas and when we have them on they sell like crazy (laughs) yeah i mean i thought that potato chips and cottage cheese sounded gross yeah until i put it in my mouth until yeah until i uh (laughs) I, i learned you good yeah now um I think the concept of a milkshake sour, in order to execute it properly, you have to have the right balance of acidity and the hops. Um, What you need to do is you need to play off of the acidity you're getting to turn hops into the ultimate fruit bombs um, that some varieties can turn into. Um, The ones that come to mind um, right away are Equinot and Simcoe. Um, Those two varieties tend to really turn into um, kind of pineapple-y type notes and um, other like grapefruity type notes. So, um, you know, the good old Citra, even though Citra has been really catty this year, I've been a super big fan of it. Um, 
but hops that are naturally fruity and the acidity will actually soften those it'll push through any kind of citrus like profile in them and uh, that's what you want to play off of um, even like characters like mango because you're gonna have sweetness from the lactose um, can play really well in there but all the things that, uh, um, that make a sour milkshake IPA sound gross uh, are the things that you're balancing out by making it a milkshake IPA, I guess, is, the, is the, um, the, the moral of the story. I was walking around, do you talk about how you're using softer hops and not like super aggro hops like Chinook and stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, actually, you should probably just throw a bunch of Warrior at this. 60-minute <laughs> edition. Just um, make it hella better. Also, somebody said you need to chug your beer. I'll chug my tea. Mostly because I had one sip left of my tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Get my beer. So yeah, yeah. Essentially, though, just trying to accentuate um, the the sort of citrus-like characteristics of the hops through that additional acidity that you're giving the beer. Absolutely, yeah. And then uh, uh, the nice thing about that is because the the thing that makes the sour milkshake IPA sound aggressive is because you've got sharpness of uh, of being a sour, and you also have. You know, usually with like, if it was like a West Coast IPA, you've got the aggression of a really hoppy beer, and so um, sour and that same sharpness from the aggression of the of the west coast style hopping techniques it does sound like it would clash and normally it would um just kind of like when you do a black ipa how you don't want a lot of roasted malts in your black ipa because you've got a lot of aggression from the hops already and so when you throw aggression from the malt like roast malt in it that does not go well it clashes and it's uh, it's it's not pleasant on the palate but when you do a milkshake IPA, you're leaning all those hops towards the back end. It's going to be generally lower in IBUs, and you're getting a lot of nice fruity and citrus notes off of your hops. Um, and then you're also sweetening the body of the beer with the lactose. And so you're kind of balancing sweet and acid, but you're going really extreme on both sides. So it's kind of in the same vein, honestly, as a pastry style. Like why a pastry style can work is because you're balancing really sweet stuff with yep. a lot of other flavors. Yeah, and I think, you know, another key too is uh, is like you, you hit it on the nose. So you're balancing acidity with the sweetness um, without any bitterness. Right. right. That That's another thing is that, um, you know, I've even seen people trying to do these – do hazies these days and they still come in with recipes that have a bittering addition yeah and that's just not the way you want to do a beer like this if you want it to have any kind of sweetness to it because that's the whole point of bittering is that you're going to balance out the sweetness and in the case of a milkshake sour you're using the acidity to balance out that sweetness instead exactly um by the way the mandatory beer chug that's ch from homebrews for life like they're they have this segment during the video. They go, ma, 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 mandatory beer chug. And then they've got like four different people with music playing in the background chugging beers. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. I should probably watch TV. <laughs> or, or other YouTube channels. Um, I watch YouTube channels. Yeah, but all your YouTube channels are like fishing and gardening. Yeah. Gardening is a big thing on YouTube. Uh, Logan basically watches YouTube like a 65-year-old couple would. Actually, according to the Google Analytics, I am 59. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's the, the general why sour milkshake IPAs actually do work. Uh, they are the, they're the pastry style uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum of the, of the IPA and sour world. They are in, they're designed to be intensely flavored, but those flavors balance out really well. Um, honestly, it's no different than when you buy sodas. Sodas are really acidic and sodas are really sweet. And because of that... You, a lot of people like them. I actually personally don't drink soda, but it's the same kind of uh, same kind of concept. Yeah. So I think one last thing to mention about the style is that um, <clears throat> so so just so that you're not confused is that you are still throwing a lot of hops at these beers too. Yeah. Um, so you're still still throwing somewhere in the range of a half pound of hops for a five gallon batch. Um, you're just going to end up using those as solely whirlpool and dry hop additions. Um, so so don't feel like just because it's not a bitter beer, it doesn't have a lot of hops in it. You Google and stuff. Okay. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no. no I was uh, so yeah. So we will be building up a recipe. Speaking of which, for everyone, and trying to link that in the description once we get this live stream published, and uh, and I guess we'll send it to uh, Homebrew for Life, right? Yeah. Is that, so is that the plan? That's the plan. We're gonna build up a I sour like milkshake IPA recipe live in person, uh, and then I will uh, copy that onto Brewer's Friend, and then I'll send a link of that on Brewer's Friend to CH from Homebrew for Life, and hopefully he will brew that up and then drink it, and he'll be like, "Wow, I did not expect that to taste good, but it actually tastes good." Should we tell him to send us one too? 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> he he does have a whole video on how to mail beer, so he should be an expert at sending us there beer. There you go. No, I'm t- saying send us a recipe, and we'll brew, brew one up, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we'll talk well, more. I'll probably purposely like be like, Haha, I'm going to make these guys brew the worst beer ever. <laughs> <laughs> brew challenge. Okay, so I'm going to get a pencil. Pencil. Who uses pencils these days? I'm going to get a pen. And then we'll uh, write down what we're talking about, and then we'll build up a recipe live for you. Oh, you're going to build it up right now? Yeah. We're gonna okay. Well, let's start with uh, 15 pounds of lactose. 15 pounds of lactose? Yes, 15 pounds of lactose. We're going to have a, a, an attenuation of 2%. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to finish out at 10, 60, where it started. Yep, pretty much. Right. So first, uh, I think it's important that we give basically two different ways to uh, shoot, shoot a doop, shoot a doop, that we give two different ways um, to sour it. So depending on equipment, uh, the two different ways that we're going to do is we're going to do souring completely with acidulated malt, uh, or actually using acidulated malt as a pitchable. So, uh, using the acidulated malt, um, to, uh, inoculate the beer. Uh, so the base of the beer is generally going to be the same. Um, and I like to go either something pretty neutral. So either Pilsner malt, or we can do a little bit of just regular two row. And then if you wanted to add some bodybuilders, you can do like wheat or a uh, chit or something like that. Whatever light baseball you got kicking around malt, balt. Yeah. Same thing. Balt. Um, so let's go ahead and say, we're going to say nine pounds of what, do, what do you, what do you think? You want to go pills or you want to go? Yeah, let's go pills. Okay. Nine pounds of pills. And then we're going to go with that. We'll go one pound of chit. Yeah. If it was Hayden, he'd probably say to use a uh, pearl malt, but yeah, nine pounds of pearl malt, uh, and then we'll go a half pound of acidulated malt. And the yeah. reason we're doing half pound of acidulated malt in both recipes is because that's actually going to balance your mash pH. It's just just something to make it so that your mash is a good pH. Yeah, we've actually experimented with a lot of um, different quantities of acid malt in five gallon <laughs> batches. Peter's dying. Don't mind him. I'm good. And uh, we've actually found that it takes about 12 ounces in the mash to f- actually even hit that threshold of perceiving the beer to be slightly tart. Um, even up to a half pound, um, you, what you'll notice is that at that point it starts to really soften the profile of a beer, um, but really doesn't make it tart. So the tartness is going to come a little later down the road. Are you going to do an extract for him too or not? No, just all uh, right. yeah. No, what, this is just for CH. Okay. So we'll Sounds do it. We'll do an extract one for uh, everybody when we do our sour kits yeah. and everything like that. But um, all right. So here's where it splits off. So uh, if you're doing the natural fermentation method, what you're going to do is pitch two pounds of acidulated malt, and that's actually going to go into the fermenter. The fermenter needs to be purged with CO2. Uh, and you need to be able to keep it warm. And so what I like to do is I'll actually take that mash and I'll run it off into my fermenter. I'll bubble CO2 up through it. Um, and then when it gets uh, down to about 120, that's when I'll pitch, uh, pitch the acid malts. And then I will close that up and I will bubble CO2 up through the bottom. And then I will let it sit uh, or free fall down to basically about 100 degrees. Uh, and that's where I'll start to use something like a firm wrap or something to keep that thing warm. Yeah, you definitely <clears> want to get keep it at least above 100 degrees. I like to keep it even higher myself. I like to I like shoot for that 115, 120 mark yeah. consistently just because it'll it'll keep out any any bugs that might get a little bit funky. So then we got to go into the how to sour it with just acid malts. And that is going to be a little bit different. Um, so instead of using two pounds of acid malt, we're going to be using 3.25 pounds of acid malt. Loading it up. Yeah. And that's going to go in at the end of the mash. Um, so that's enough acid malt because there's acid producing bacteria that uh, have already made the lactic acid on the malt, um, that that will get your sour pretty sour already. Um, now that said, this one will be a little bit less lactic acid than the naturally fermented one because that acid malt um, that's in the naturally fermented one will, pr- will produce more. Um, but yeah, that, from the, from the <clears throat> bacteria on it. Yeah. Uh, but that's it. It's the, we're, well, that's obviously why we're using a little bit more on the uh, on the pitch here at the end of the mash. And so, three point two five pounds of acid malt, um, and just to sour the end of the mash. Uh, the one that we pitch the acid malt at the end of the mash, that's immediately going to go up into a boil. So after you boil it, then uh, you kill the heat and you add all your hops and then you let it sit for a little bit and then you whirlpool it down and you add some more hops. Should be able to do a short boil on this too if you want to. Absolutely. Um, no need to do a full hour boil. 20 minutes is just fine. Um, get a little protein break, get a little, get through that hot break and call it good. Yeah, here we are. So we're not trying to do like a, yeah, obviously we're not trying to get that aggression. Um, and since we're basically doing uh, um, 
close to a no sparge. I guess we'll be doing a little bit of a sparge on this one, um, but uh, close to a no sparge, it's not going to be a huge deal if you um, if you don't boil for a long time because you don't have to reduce volume as much. Um, so back over to the pitched acid malt. What we're going to be doing on that one is we're going to let that sit for 24 to 36 hours, and we're going to be tasting it as we go. Uh, if you're using a pH meter, you can do that to kind of check it as, as it goes. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good uh, um situation to uh, take advantage of a pH meter if you have one. Um, you, it'll really help you monitor those those uh, pH drops and kind of guesstimate where you're going to want to stop that. Yep. The uh, uh, acidity of the entire thing should be uh, right around 4.2 to 4.5 going into fermentation. Unless you just want to get crazy with it. Yeah. Uh, well, then at the end, of, so at the end of fermentation, it'll probably drop somewhere around 3.6 to 3.8. Um, and that's, that, but I like to go by taste. You can definitely tell when it's starting to get tart. So after 36 hours of fermentation, doing the same thing with that, you're drawing that back off up into a boil. Um, you want, do want to taste it to use your palate, make sure it's not uh, baby vomit puke kind of flavor. Yeah, um, if that's the case, you probably let it get too cold. Yeah, let it get too cold or let it get let oxygen in there or something like that. Um, but the, the hard thing to do in this is to just make sure that it's warm and doesn't have oxygen. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, so then once you uh, get to your desired pH, you're just going to put that back into your boil kettle. Um, you're going to kill off any of the uh, lactobacillus or another wild microbes that might be uh, doing their thing in there. Um, and then the same thing as with the first batch. You'll, uh, once, once you get it up to a rolling boil, get through that hop break, um, throw in your chiller, do a nice whirlpool addition um, with whatever hops of your choice are, and uh, call it a day. So we'll do a... Oh, pitch 07, too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah, 07, yeah. Oh, seven. It's a very, very acid tolerant, and so oh, seven, and then also just a great overall yeast. Yeah, it's German ale yeast. Yeah, it leans into the maltiness. Um, it's going to be Kaiser with Imperial, but uh, uh, a great overall yeast to use. Um, yeah, so that's going to be it. So uh, I'll put together, together with some specific hops. Um, oh, lactose. We forgot. When you're bringing it up to a boil, either recipe, you got to add lactose. Uh, you want to err on the sweet side. So a pound or more of lactose is what you're going to see in every milkshake IP I've seen up yeah. to two pounds. I don't like to go two pounds. Uh, somewhere between a pound and a pound and a half is kind of my sweet spot. Um, so we'll go ahead and do 1.25 pounds of lacto, uh, lactose sugar, not lactobacillus. <laughs> that's a, it's confusing. A lot of lact stuffs. Um, and then you'll, yeah, like uh, both these will be chilled down and go into the fermenter, pitch 07, German ale yeast. And then the last thing you do to make a milkshake IPA super duper is you add some sort of fruit. Which, like we mentioned in the pastry stout, could be um, honestly a lot of different fruits. And in fact, we actually made a video on that, didn't we? We did make a video on that. Whole video on mm -hmm. different fruits, um, but something something that might even add a little less acidity that will build on that, I would say. So yeah. any of your like strawberry, raspberry um, blueberry, maybe even blueberry yeah. sounds good. Blueberry I've, I've sounds seen really it good. in a lot of ways. Like yeah. blueberry, I've seen blueberry cinnamon work really well in a milkshake IPA. Actually, yep. So, there you go. So yeah, we'll uh, we'll let you guys pick the fruit, and then I'll I'll make mm -hmm. this into a recipe and send it over to them, and hopefully, too bad it's not the season for uh, huckleberries. As well, I don't think anybody in California has huckleberries. <sighs> I mean, we can make it happen. <laughs> yeah, we'll just ship them we frozen huckleberries. Elderberry, <laughs> elderberries. That elderberry sour was amazing. That was super, really good. We've done a lot of sours, so anyway. yeah, anything that sour in IPA world for us is like, hey, we really Back like on that. track. Back on track. So we'll make this recipe. We'll link it in the description. If you guys want to try it, just let us, uh, you know, let us know. Just throw it on Instagram. Be like, hey, I'm trying your guys' sour IPA recipe. That's so cool. And that's, yeah, that's that. That's that. So that's Peter's entire outline. At this point, we'll open it up to general questions. If you guys have on beer or want to pick our brains, if we uh, miss some things about uh, milkshake sours that you want to hear about or we just confused you about. I have a tendency to do that. Oh yeah, blackberry. Blackberry is actually um, a softer fruit, though. It's weird. It's it's pungent when you eat it, but when you put it in beer, it's a lot softer compared to something like a raspberry. But it does make the color really, really beautiful. Uh, blackberry? Yeah, the color makes it. It makes it's, it really. I don't if you get, get a lot of color from blackberry. Actually, well, if you use five pounds yeah. of it, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, if you use five pounds of anything, I get fro color. my my strategy for berry fruits in <laughs> general is I go ahead and I freeze them, which uh, explodes the cell walls, and then that also I pasteurize them after that. The, it intensifies the color, and that makes it uh, um, makes it super super beautiful. Yeah. So Trevin is asking about <clears throat> when to check the mash pH. I mean, you can check the mash pH whenever you want, um, but the important part of checking uh, your pH um, is going to be um, Basically, when it hits your kettle to make sure that you are for if you're doing the, the acid malt at the end of the mash, 
Um, check it when it hits your kettle. Make sure that you're down to the pH that you're looking for. Um, and then when you are doing it with the kettle sour method, using the lactic or the acidulated malt to inoculate the beer, you're actually going to want to check that periodically, about every 12 hours, um, because it'll drop. Um, slowly throughout that time and depending on what temperature you have it at and depending on just how happy the uh, lactobacillus is um, it might go a little bit faster a little bit slower depending on your situation yeah mm -hmm. so but yeah target ph 4.2 right that's that's what you want uh, 4.2 is before what's you considered pitch yeah before you can that's what's considered uh food safe in the uh um if you're like if you're kettle souring yeah, so try to, sh try to shoot for right about that 4.2 range before you pitch your yeast. And then, like Peter said, it'll probably drop a little bit more after you do that. And uh, when it's all said and done, it'll taste amazing. Yeah. Uh, mm. What's a good inexpensive pH meter? Oh, they said Vanilla. expensive at first. <laughs> what's a good expensive pH meter? Yes. Uh, the one that we just got in runs around 30 maybe 35 bucks, and it's the HANA um, Instruments. Yeah, so we'll be actually testing that out on some sours probably this afternoon. So. Um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll try to, uh, link that in that video at some point mm. if it, uh, does work properly for us, but it did come with a whole bunch of, uh, bunch of nice little buffering solutions and yeah. stuff like that to get it calibrated. So seem seemed, seemed legit. I got it calibrated yesterday. The whole packaging, the packaging was really nice and yeah. it seemed to work well. Did you videotape that? Yes, I did. <sighs> well, we have, we have extra that. calibration <laughs> stuff. So we can make it happen. Um, mm. How sour would a sour beer made with kiwi be? I've never actually brewed with a New Zealander, oh my God, so I'm that not sounds sure. amazing. Yes. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> find a New Zealander, brew with him, and then <laughs> you know, find we out. Do, we do have the next wallet beer coming up. Oh, that's true. How much do we want to spend on kiwis? <laughs> a lot? No, no, we don't. That's a lot. Of, uh, you turned down Altoids because it was like 25 bucks. Okay, but now now it's for real, and <laughs> and, we, and we get to have Rachel brew with it. So that's uh, true. Which for all of you that well, are no, uh, Chad's picking those ingredients. Ah, dang it, that's right. Yeah, but we do have the uh, the steel barrel brew off that's gonna happen after that. That's gonna be the just round six, whip six. Jesus, lots of stuff going on. Lots of stuff going on. For those of you stuff. not in the know how, um, we uh, our next Bullet Beer Challenge, we are actually inviting um, the folks over at TT's Old Iron Brewery, um, including Chad White and uh, I don't know what Rachel's last name Nally? is actually. Rachel Nally, is yeah. that it? Yeah, um, and the uh, head brewer down there, Chad White, is uh, one of the uh, owners, co-owners. And uh, yeah, so they're going to be challenging, I think, Tim again to uh, a Bullet Beer Challenge. Um, so somebody's saying they're fermenting the castor muncha kit. 70 degrees for a day, then chill to 40. Yeah, 70 is a little on the high side, um, but, you know, with that, as long as you're using that 3470 yeast, it, it's pretty forgiving. Um, it's a low VDK yeast, so. Yeah, it's, yeah, you should be fine. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't necessarily. Oh, I see. They're fermenting it at 64. Sorry. Um, um, chill to 44 adding coffee. That depends on how good your s system is sealed. I don't like chilling, honestly, in primary fermenters if it's just like a carboy because it creates that negative pressure. And then when you're opening up and adding the coffee, it's just going to suck air back in. Um, or it's going to be sucking air slash uh, um, liquid in during the um, from your airlock. So uh, I don't know. I would probably actually just... Uh, put it in a closed system and then um, add the coffee and then transfer after the closed system if you can. Um, if not, I would just not tr chill it and I would just add it at room temperature and then the next day go ahead and um, uh, go ahead and get into, into a keg right afterwards. I just made a note of the kiwi beer. I really want to do it now. I'm not right. going to lie. <laughs> <clears throat> so Kiwi milkshake IPA. Uh, it's going to happen. Uh, We're going to have to look into how expensive kiwis are. Yes. Yeah, that's 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 a big factor, yeah. Well and the Altoids too was like way more than you ever wanted to put in a beer. Yeah. It was like it was like two much. pounds of Altoids. Yeah. And it's also gonna start to taste like root beer beer at that at that point in time. Uh. Um all right, so a little bit of uh, another prompt on uh on questions to maybe ask or talk about just to build a discussion. Um is there a good way that we can get people on the brewing YouTube world to be more collaborative. So we've, this is going to be kind of a challenge, hopefully where both us and homebrew for life are able to do something together. Um, and, uh, you know, have a similar challenge to go to, to do basically. But what are, what are ways that you've seen or things that you think would be, be good for helping other people that are in the brewing YouTube world, be collaborative and work together. Are you talking to idea. me? Or are you talking to the viewers? Talk, talking to everybody. <laughs> talking to everybody. What are the, what are the ideas? Yeah. <laughs> Any ideas? Hey, somebody purchased an ink bird. That's cool. Yeah, those things are awesome. 
They're, uh, oh, yeah. Hayden does this weird balloon thing for his uh, with uh, Suckback when he does crashing. Oh, yeah. I actually did that once when we had those uh, big Speedles. Yeah. Yeah, I took a bag and filled it with CO2 and then rubber banded around the blow-off tube when we crashed it because nice. I was super worried about Suckback. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, balloon, I guess, for Suckback. That's, a, that's a, good, uh, a good thing. I've seen it work on Hayden's system, too, and it's, it looks weird, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> Most things that look weird do work. <laughs> Just like you. Uh, <laughs> oh, sad day. Uh, is there any more questions that people have? If not, we'll probably start wrapping this up. Yeah, pretty soon. Um, mash pH should be 5.2. It's supposed to be standard recipe says mash pH is supposed to be 5.2 beginning of the mash. Oh, is the 5.2 at the beginning or at the end? Uh, no, checking your mash pH at the very at the beginning to make sure it's 5.2 is what we do. That said, usually you want to calculate your mash to end up in 5.2, and uh, it's going to be, um, you know. It, you you kind of it's gonna be one of those things that it can vary between like five point one is a little on the low side but not terrible five is like usually you're not getting the same enzymatic reactions at at a pH of five but you can go all the way up to five point four or a little bit higher than five point four and your enzymes are still gonna be all functioning in the same kind of realm so five point two is kind of that sweet spot apparently kiwis are really cheap so yes the game <clears throat> is a the game is a foot the game is a foot <laughs> not a hand it's a foot. Uh, Somebody's saying uh, we just need to share our Will It Brew challenge with other YouTubers. Um, and, uh, and then what's a cheap meal under $100? Ooh, that's, that's a tricky question. So the, the key word there is cheap um, instead of inexpensive. Yeah. Because uh, generally in that $100 price range, you can get a variety of two more roller mills, and they're pretty much all the same. Um, they will get the job done, but my ex my experience with those is that you'll actually have to do a double grind, uh, where where you actually have to um, reset the mill in between your grinds. Um, so I mean, pretty much anyone will work, but they're if you can, if you have it in the budget, go go for a three roller mill. It's going to save you headaches in the long run. Yeah, the, like the Captain Crush or whatever it's called. I think that's in that in that price range. Yeah, all the ones in those price range are the same, like uh, factory out of China. Um, they, they look nearly identical and they function pretty identical. Yeah. So the biggest, the biggest issue I've run into with those little two mills or roller mills is that if you're trying to get a fine crush, um, the rollers won't actually grab the grains to pull them in. Um, yeah. and that's why you have to do that double crush is because you actually have to do like a really coarse crush just so that it'll grab it in. And then you have to reset the whole mill and then run a second crush through it to get to where you want to be. Or you can just deal so. with a coarse crush, which is, yeah, you know, I mean, there's, there's that too. Um, might just mean a little longer mash for you. Uh, can you kettle sour a beer with unmilled grain? Absolutely. Uh, most people actually do kettle sour with unmilled grain. We use milled grain um, mostly just if we're going to extract any extra sugars or body or whatever. Um, it's yeah, harder you get to get some extraction from it. Yeah, that, that, that is a fact. It's harder to uh, to filter out milled grain, actually, which is why a lot of people do sour with uh, un unmilled grain. Um, but uh, yeah, you can sour with either one. The lactobacillus, uh, the, bact the lactic acid producing bacteria are actually on the outsides of the grain anyway, so. Yep. Somebody's asking us if we have used a 30 minute bittering addition. And yeah, of course. Um, in fact, that's if I add a bittering addition more often than not, just because we have a lot of hops at our disposal here, um, I will do it as a 30 minute because that's sort of that marginal area where you actually can get some residual flavor of the hop in the beer where at 60 minutes, um, you're getting very little flavor from the hop itself. It's pretty much all bittering. Our quote unquote bittering addition for the <laughs> challenge beer yesterday was it's like 20 to 30 minutes. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, 20 is a, 20 is a really good sweet spot if, if you do want a little bit of bitterness. Um, Especially if you're leaning into, like, the hazy slash milkshake slash juicy kind of style. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be – profile. If you're doing, um, like, a double imperial West Coast thing that's, you know, 100 IBUs, it's probably yeah. not going to be super efficient to to throw, you know, six ounces of, of hops at 20 minutes to, to for your bittering. But, uh, but, you know, for something like a hazy that you're really looking for, like, sub-20s, if, if even not even less – then, uh, then yeah, totally go for it. Uh, someone's mentioning the serial killer two roller mill. Um, yeah, hundred bucks. Like, like I said, that's the same. Uh, that is a, the exact same body as uh, a, a lot of those same. Two yeah, mills I think that are they're price range. they're pretty much all the same. They're just <laughs> rebranded. That's yeah. that's really all I've seen. Yeah, between there's there's probably a half dozen of them out there, and they all look exactly the same. So, I'm pretty sure they're coming from the same factory. Yeah, bam. All right. That, uh, let's see, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, uh, we'll close it out in a solid two minutes, if not. Thank you guys for tuning in this week. It's, uh, we're, we're a little worse for wear after yesterday. Um, definitely a long day for us with uh, 
making beer and making barbecue and having a lot of people making babies doing, yeah moving parts and trying to organize it all and not have it be a chaotic mess and keep people six feet apart and all that so yeah par for the course par for the course just Life's another crazy manic sunday genius. monday <laughs> saturday all right uh stay tuned next sunday we will uh, be coming with uh, another live stream for you as well as uh, keep an eye out we try to publish at least um, a couple videos every week now yeah so uh we've got a good backlog so we will be having at least one or two come out this week yep um hopefully we'll be getting a wi will it beer out for you as well words are hard and uh we'll see you next time yeah bam museli pint challenge uh. Sour starter, huh? Interesting. Add all the liquid. Add all the liquid. All the liquid. That's what Peter's saying. Um, Lacto's a weird thing to actually try to do a starter with because you, you want to do the opposite. Yeah, it's got to be an yeah. aerobic starter. Yeah, I was going to say it's the opposite. It's <laughs>